is universally acclaimed for his outstanding lyric tenor voice. His voice has exceptional clarity and tonal purity. His extraordinary versatility garners praise from audiences and critics alike in all genres of music, whether it's opera, operetta, oratorio, baroque, or the classics of Broadway and modern musical theater. His name is Marc Dubois. Marc has performed with every major orchestra in Canada and several in the United States. His busy career on opera and concert stages has taken him around the world. Mark has performed for the late Pope John Paul II, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, former President Ronald Reagan, and former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Join me, Diana Bombaca, as I talk one-on-one -on -one with Mark Dubois right after this break. I have five children, and I have known right away that music was a very, very important part of their life. Even before they were born, when they were kicking in their mommy's tummy, I would hum them a melody. Mm -hmm. And when they were born, I would hum them that same melody, and it would have the same effect on them to calm them down. And you, then you know that everything they hear, and music is such uh, an emotional thing that uh, it sticks with them the rest of their life, and you can't have a better friend than a song. Welcome to One on One. My name is Diana Bumbaka. Joining me today is Canadian tenor Mark Dubois. Thank you very much for joining me today, Mark. You're welcome. Now, Mark, how did you first get started in the opera? In the opera, it took a little while, but singing-wise, I don't remember not singing. I remember fondly Saturday mornings with my mom. My father worked six days a week, so Saturday mornings were showtime, and we'd create our own little musicals and dances, and, uh, and then when Dad got home, we'd do them for him. And uh, that started me off wanting to perform. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I had a piano teacher who was given a position in a church as a choir director and he asked permission for my parents to train me to sing and that's when it all started I was six and a half years old and I knew right away that's where I wanted to go. So at the age of six did you know you wanted to be an opera singer or just a performer of some kind? Very shortly after that I knew I wanted to be a performer but very the choir that I was in was a touring choir and we would do a sacred section at the beginning of the program and then the middle of the program was a little operetta that would be written for kids mm -hmm. and in those days because it was all a boy choir we had to play the parts of girls as well so um, I longed for the time that I get to play the male lead instead of one of the girls in the chorus but that's when the bug got me to not only uh, perform but to sing and perform and to dress up mm -hmm. in, in beautiful uh, uh, theatrical outfits and <coughs> that's opera. How did you, or how long did it take for you to train your voice to reach the levels that you do? I started training when I was six and a half, seven, and I never stopped until I was close to 30. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenges did you face in getting to where you are today? All sorts. Opera is the uh, most expensive art form in the world because it incorporates not only the singing, the acting, the costumes, the orchestra, the dancing. Uh, it So therefore, w because there's so many elements to it, there can be so many problems. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that you are your own instrument. I'm not playing a piano, I'm not holding a violin, I'm not blowing into a flute or a uh, clarinet. I travel with my instrument as part of my body, so there again you have a problem because everything that happens to you happens to your voice, mm -hmm. emotionally, uh, uh, physically, sickness, uh, when you're sad, when you're happy, when you're depressed, when you're anxious, it's all part of your body, it's part of your brain, so therefore it affects your voice. How do you maintain your voice when you're not on stage performing? I, I'm very careful 
with uh, whether it be what I eat, how much sleep I get, which is difficult when you're raising a family, but you, you work around it and you know, you meet so many people after shows. Just the other day I must have sh shaken hands with more than a hundred people and inevitably there's the people who want a big hug mm -hmm. whether they know you or not and gosh knows what what they're carrying, what a cold or a cough, but you know, if I wasn't able to do that, I wouldn't want to be in this profession. Mm -hmm. I love the people. What does it mean to have fans, people who know your music inside and out? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Especially when, you know, at this stage in my career, I, I still go back to many of the places that I've been performing for the last 30 years. And there are people there that actually remember my debut when I was 21 or 22 years old. And they said, do you remember when you did it? And in fact, some of the things they say, I do remember. I remember very, very well. Or somebody will come up to me and say, you know, I awarded you the first prize in such and such a Kiwanis festival. And I never remember their names, mm -hmm. but believe me, I do remember their faces. And if they just tell me sort of where and when, then it all clicks. And that's a beautiful part of being a performer. And when you read letters from people of all different ages, uh, it's, it's nice to know that the accolations don't just stop at the end of a show. It goes on. Mm -hmm. And the next time you perform, that same person may be at that concert. And they say, oh, wow, I didn't think it could be any better, but this was even better. And it, it's a lovely feeling to know when you walk into a place there's people who you know whisper and say well they're uh, but they're very respectful of my my space they don't just sort of jump up from their table and come over i'm not a superstar like one of the movie stars they're very respectful of that and when i'm with my family of course too so you haven't had any odd fan encounters i have had odd fan <laughs> encounters yes i have i really have but um i fortunately my mother always told me that now that you're doing this, when I, when I started to really do it, my mother always told me, no matter where you go, you must dress well, you must look well, because people will know you. And it irritates my children to no end, because whenever they're with me, I say, no, you can't dress like that. <laughs> I know, somebody knows you. That's the way it is. Well, on that note, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk some more about your career highlights. Please stay with us. More to come on One on One with Mark Dubois. Welcome back to One on One. Today I am speaking with Marc Dubois. Now Marc, I'd like to ask you, how would you explain an opera performance to someone who's never seen opera before? Difficult question. Opera is not easily explained, uh, particularly if it's not in a language that the person who's hearing it or seeing it uh, can understand. Fortunately, uh, Canada actually produced uh, what's called uh, super titles, which have the translations go above the stage. I find them very distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, opera, you need to sit there and suspend your imagination just as you do with ballet. And you simply look at what's happening, hear the music, let the music explain the drama. And if you can do that, you'll really appreciate it. If all you're going to do is watch what the translation is, you're going to miss the best parts. Mm -hmm. You should always uh, read what the opera's about. So you go and you've got, a, you've got a feeling for it. And then let the actors, the singers, take you into that world and submerge yourself in that world. But if you just sit out there and watch, you're not going to get it. Now you touched on languages a little bit there. How many languages do you sing in? Well, I have sung in a total of 12 languages, of which I can, I can work very well in five languages. Okay. And I can speak, I can get around. When I'm in Paris, for instance, I don't uh, uh, have a problem. Same with in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no problem with the language, or in Germany or Aus Austria. Although, uh, I'm certainly, my grammar is terrible. But the people are always very receptive to um, somebody trying to speak their language. Mm -hmm. 
Also, the problem I have is that most of the operas that I sing or the musical uh, in another language, they're very poetic. Mm -hmm. So if I met you and you were in Italy and I started to speak Italian to you, you'd think I was kind of funny because it would be like me speaking in English of uh, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Oh, be some other name. You'd think it was Shakespeare. And these people keep a straight face. And I'm trying to be <laughs> serious, but I'm speaking poetic because th the operas were all written in this uh, poetic style. Now, there are different styles of music, and you've sang opera, um, operettas, Broadway musicals, and every time you've received rave reviews. Do you find different challenges with, with each style of music? Yes, certainly I do, although uh, I'm, I'm one of the people who maintains that the technique of singing, the breathing, supporting the sound, placing the sound, is the same for all those genres of music. Mm -hmm. The difference is the style. You don't sing Puccini the same way as you sing Andrew Lloyd Webber, or Verdi the same way as you sing Handel. Uh, you change the color of your voice, but the production is the same. So there are those challenges, but I love the challenges. I have never been an opera singer only. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know what my life would have been like if all I did was opera. I love to do operetta, oratorio, uh, my own solo recital work with just piano and voice. I love to do orchestral works. I love to do symphony works. That's why I'm still in the profession. Do you also write your own operas and operettas? No, I do write presentations. Uh, uh, introducing children to opera has been a passion of mine for the last, uh, well, 10 years at least. Mm -hmm. But I have written shows that introduce kids to opera. And uh, I love that because somebody has to do it. Because, you know, you're on that stage there and you look out and you see an audience that is aging and you don't see enough young people. Mm -hmm. And you wonder to yourself, who's going to be out there 20 years from now? And who's going to be up here 20 years from now? And it's going to be the kids. Mm -hmm. So is opera just for adults, or should it also be for children? It should be for everybody. It should be for everybody, absolutely. OK, well, when we come back from break, we're going to talk a little bit more about what you do to encourage children to partake in opera. Please stay with us. There's more to come after this break with Marc Dubois. Welcome back to One on One. Today I am speaking with Mark Dubois. Mark, in many of the articles I've read, media have said that you've done a lot to forward music in Canada. Uh, what have some of your accomplishments been? Well, I think one of them, the, the original one, was that I was offered, uh, when I became uh, ready to go on to a professional career, I was offered contracts in France and in Italy that would have taken me away from Canada. And fortunately, there was enough work here, and I took a big chance. So I built my entire career in this country and went all over this country and, and the United States. But I, I didn't have to go to Europe and then return triumphant after five, five years. Um, and in that way, there is this, this gap uh, for young people. Where do they go? If they graduate from University of Toronto or Ryerson or, or Sheridan or whatever the college is, well, they have to go into the big bad world. Well, how do they do that? I try to guide them as to how. I also uh, do, a, as I said, a lot of work with uh, young people. I have a select studio in the Hockley Valley, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful students who are all very serious of of either just developing their voices or some of them to go on and have a career. And I've been taking some select uh, students to various concerts that I do. For instance, a big fundraising concert. They'll back me up. We'll do the prayer, the Celine Dion, uh, Andre Bocelli. Mm -hmm. And I'll do it with six of my senior students behind me. Um, and introducing them to what it's really like in the world. Um, I've also promoted a lot of uh, concerts that include 
uh, genres of music that people don't normally get to hear uh, right across the country because I believe that when people come to the theater now they want to hear more than just opera they want to hear all the different kinds of music so I've really promoted that but most of all I've done it as a Canadian mm -hmm. I'm born here I'm educated here I've made my career here yet I've been able to travel all over the world singing what advice would you give to an up-and-coming performer slow go very slowly I was very fortunate to have coaches that every time I, I remember so fondly bringing a, a piece of music that I really wanted to sing into my lesson and my wonderful teacher Madam Irene Jessner she would just pick it up look at it and say no and she put it on the floor because I wasn't ready to sing it mm -hmm. and that is the best advice I can give any singer now is to have somebody around you you can trust who knows you knows your voice knows what you're capable of and is also uh, honest enough to simply say no you're not ready in your experience with working with children how important is it for them to have music in their lives or the experience of that <laughs> it's very important uh, right f I I have five children and I have known f right away that music was a very very important part of their life even before they were born when they were kicking in their mummy's tummy I would hum them a melody mm -hmm. and when they were born I would hum them that same melody and it would have the same effect on them to calm them down and you then you know that everything they hear and music is such uh, an emotional thing that uh, it sticks with them the rest of their life mm -hmm. and you can't have a better friend than a song you know through thick and thin when you're down and out and we've all been there you know it's not all been great mm -hmm. there are the great times there's the bad times but there's with a song you can always make it and with a song you don't need an orchestra you don't need a recording you don't need anything but you and wherever you are no matter how bad it is no matter how good it is you can always sing a song and that's a great gift and that's a God-given thing mm -hmm. and I really believe that's important that everybody has a song in their soul on that note we'll take another break here on one-on-one -on -one. when we come back we'll discuss more of your career highlights please stay with us there's more to come on one-on-one -on -one. Welcome back to One on One. Today we are talking with Mark Dubois. Now Mark, you have performed for some remarkable people. Can you tell me about some of your career highlights? I think the greatest highlight uh, I had was to sing opposite the great Joan Sutherland in her last uh, performances of Ophelia mm -hmm. in Hamlet. And I played Laertes, her older brother. And I, I was anything but her older brother. and. Uh, it was just such a thrill because this is a voice I had been listening to since I was a boy soprano. And then I got to sing the Barber of Seville with the greatest Barber of Seville that ever lived, which was Herman Pry. And I couldn't believe here I was in San Diego, and there's the big uh, uh, Largo al factotum that he sings with this guitar that they had made for him the year before I was born for his his first barber down in San Diego and here we were doing it together what a thrill now your career has taken you around the world where are some of the places you've been oh New Zealand Australia Austria Germany Prague England Paris Ireland all over the United States is there a favorite venue for you to perform in Yes, I, I have. You, you get you get favorites. Uh, one of them is Old Massey Hall in Toronto. It's one of the best places I've ever performed in, and it's never been replaced. Now I wanted to ask you. You don't tour as much as you used to, but what was your most recent tour like? 
Well, it was great. As far as the tour is concerned, uh, you know, it's four or five days, and I was I was singing for the Austrian uh, Tourist Bureau in, in promoting uh, Austrian tourism. So I was down in Houston and Philadelphia and Atlanta and New York, and that's always a thrill to go to cities like that and sing. And uh, it wasn't a high stress job, so that's even nicer when it's not high stress. You can enjoy mm -hmm. things and. The, the lady I'm married to is half Austrian, so they've sort of adopted me as an ambassador to Austria. So it, it helps. I've been to Austria a lot. And so I, I promote the music, which Austria is a nation of music, 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 music. Now you have performed with every major orchestra in Canada and several in the U.S. What is it like to perform with so many talented musicians? It's always a thrill. It's always a thrill, especially when you, you, you have a world-class orchestra behind you and you, you're in front of 3,000 people and you have 80 people behind you playing, maybe a choir of 200, there's no feeling like it. I am the happiest person in the world when I am on stage with musicians, great musicians, or just on stage doing what I do and that's singing. Now I noticed on your lapel you have a diamond pin. Can you tell me about that? That is a gift from my children. And as, as there were more children, they were added to the, the gift. It's a good luck thing. Um, whenever I'm performing, always for now 20 years since they started um, this, uh, it's been on my lapel. On every jacket I wear, every tuxedo, every tails, every white. And even when I'm performing opera, I have it somewhere on my, my person. Uh, it's simply a good luck thing, and I've never once forgotten it. Do you have any superstitions when it comes to performing? No. No? Okay, well that's a no, good thing then. No, I don't. I, this is just a good luck thing, but as far as superstitions are concerned, no, many people do. Mm -hmm. I just go on and do my job. Now you have the title of one, as one of the greatest lyric tenors in Canada. How does having that title make you feel? Uh, it's scary, especially, you know, I'm, I'm supposedly in my prime now. When tenors hit the age of 50 years old, you're in your prime from now till you stop singing. And you realize you come to your prime and you've still got this label as being one of the great artists of your country. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's pretty scary because you, 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 you want to stay up there and you want to keep performing. And I am performing and I'm going to stay up there as long as I can because I can't imagine doing anything else. Well, Mark, I want to say thank you very much for joining me today. You're very welcome. That wraps up another edition of One on One. We hope to see you next time.